I will talk today about the graft engagement. I have provided graft talks in the past, and I suggest you review those under my playlist, Cardiac Catheterization. I will try to use today some new cases and some updated diagrams and idea. So we have a different collection each time. So this is a basic image anatomy that you need to absolutely know. There are three types of vein grafts. You have first the vein graft to RCA, vein graft to LAD diagonal, and vein graft to OM. And you need to know their order down to up and right to left. So down to up, you have vein graft to RCA, then vein graft to diagonal LAD, then vein graft to OM. Right to left, it's that same sequence. The vein graft to RCA is on the right surface of the aorta whereas the vein graft to diagonal is on the anterior left surface, and the vein graft to OM is also anterior left, but more left and a little more posterior than the vein graft to diagonal. The third idea related to the anatomy of those grafts is that the vein graft to RCA looks down, very much down usually, whereas the vein graft to diagonal and vein graft to OM look up, progressively up. The vein graft to OM tends to have a shepherd crook look, it looks way up, then sharply points down. So those three ideas will be very important for you to know uh, where to look for those grafts as you're trying to engage them, right to left, down to up, and what catheters to use. You need catheters pointing down to engage the vein graft to the right, whereas you need catheters pointing up for grafts to the left. Okay? So very important image that you need to memorize here. Down to up, right to left and down pointing versus upward pointing takeoff. An additional graft uh, that we usually have is the lima, left internal mammary artery. The lima is usually an in situ graft uh, that is a branch of the left subclavian artery and that gets connected to the left anterior descending artery. So when we engage the lima, there are usually two big engagement steps. One, you need to engage the left subclavian, then you need to engage the lima. And I will go over the, those two steps. But remember already, you have two big engagement step for the lima versus one engagement step for the rest of the grafts and for the native arteries. Also, what I describe about the vein grafts will apply for radial grafts that are sometimes used as an alternative to vein grafts. Another important idea here, whenever you look at a graft uh, in geography, you have to realize the graft hooks typically in an end to side to the native vessel. So that graft is going to fill the native vessel antigradely, you know, this way, but also retrogradely, backward, all the way to the point of subtotal or total occlusion of the native vessel. So whenever you assess a graft in geography, always analyze the antegrade and retrograde unobstructed flow into the native vessels. And I will go uh, over that a little later as well. So knowing those ideas about anatomy and takeoff of the grafts, there are always four steps you should think of each time you think of engaging in graft. Which catheter to use, down pointing for the right, up pointing for the left grafts, which view to use to engage, how to torque clock, counter clock, or combination, and which views to image. Once you've engaged, which views to use to see that graft and the anastomosis and the uh, runoff it supplies. So I will answer which view to use when engaging. So we remember we use the LAO view to engage the native vessels, RCA and LCA. In terms of graft, you have to always use a view that is orthogonal to the takeoff of that graft in order to be able to engage it, in order to lay it out and be able to point into it and engage it. So for the graft to the right, the LAO view is what is orthogonal to that graft and what is used to engage it. For the graft to the left, it's RAO view. And this is another illustration in an axial cut. So this is a graft to the right, it's on the right surface of the aorta. The LAO view will be orthogonal to that takeoff, and you make your catheter point this way uh, in an LAO view. Okay, you make your catheter point this way in an LAO view. 
Conversely, the graphs to the left are on the left and anterior surface of the aorta. So RAO view typically is what is orthogonal to, the, to those graphs. LAO view will be looking in those, those graphs and it will be hard to engage those graphs in an LAO view. You need RAO and sometimes even a steep RAO view to be orthogonal to those graphs, which tends to be left, but also anterior on the surface of the aorta, okay? Uh, and uh, by the way, those ideas apply to both. And most of the ideas I will describe here apply to both femoral and transfemoral and transradial engagement uh, of grafts. And later on, I will give a section specifically about radial tips in graft engagement. This is an illustration of the views to engage. So this is a graft to the RCA in an LAO view. See how the LAO lays out the ostium very nicely, orthogonal to it, and we make our catheter point this way this way. So we make the catheter point to the right surface of the aorta to engage the graft to the right. Conversely, the graft to OM, which is here, this is the marker of the graft to the OM, it's looking at us. So if you want to engage it in an LEO view, you need to fish for it and make the catheter look at you, which is a little hard. So it's best to go and make your angle this way, look from this direction in an REO fashion, be orthogonal to that graft and try to engage it and you make it the catheter look toward the anterior surface of the aorta, point in that direction, which is anterior. In an REO, you point in that direction, the anterior surface to engage it, okay? What you have here also, we have markers, which we don't always have. Those are metallic circles that are placed around the ostium of the graft for the purpose of helping us engage the graft. Uh, note, uh, that in, this patient actually had occluded a graft and you see here a nipple, okay? This is uh, what you need to see to prove that the graft is occluded. You inject it and you see just a nipple flush filling that proves that the graft is occluded. You're into it and the ostium is occluded. Those are other illustrations. This is again, this is here an REO view for a graft to the left. So we have here a Judkins right four engaging graft to the LAD. So notice this is a graft to the RCA, graft to the LED, graft to the OM in that order. Lower, medium, higher, okay? So this is GR4 in a graft to the LED in an REO view. Here we can play it. And this is an REO view for a graft to OM, okay? And notice here that, uh, that graft to LED and OM both look up, but particularly the graft to OM has a very sharp turn up than down. It's a shepherd crook, a crook appearance, okay? Uh, and notice then in an REO view uh, that graft to RCA is looking at us. So it's not a good view for it. If you want to engage that graft to RCA here, that circle, you have to go LAO. So a mnemonic to memorize it, it's opposite of the graph. So if you have a graph to the RCA, you need an LAO view. If you have a graph to the left, you need an REO view. So left graph, REO view, right graph, LAO view. That's how you can help memorize it, okay? In that case, sometimes, like I said, we need even a steep REO. Look, that circle is not very flat. If you have circle markers and you want to engage the graft, it's best to get in a view that makes that circle look like a line, okay? You keep moving more REO and that circle becomes like a line, which tells you that view is exactly orthogonal to the takeoff. And that will be the best engagement. Like here for that graft to the right, go even steeper LEO, that circle will become like a line. Both walls are aligned and now you're perfectly orthogonal to the ostium. You don't have to do that, but that makes it even easier if you can. So another idea that among those questions, that third question, how to torque the catheter. So we decided which view now, how to torque the catheter. So I will start with the graph to the right. Then I'll mention the graph to the left. So graph to the right, do you clock or counter clock the catheter from a neutral position? So the answer here is counterclockwise. It's, remember, it's opposite to RCA engagement. That's why fellows get confused. They think, you know, for 
the RCA is here on the right surface of the aorta and the graft to the right is on the right surface. So we should probably just clock like we do for the native RCA, but it often doesn't work. You need counter clock for the graft of the RCA, which is opposite to the native RCA. Now, I'll explain why. Here's the idea you need to understand first. A clocking a catheter 180 degree and counter clocking the catheter 180 degree do not get you to the same point. If you're playing with a catheter outside the body, clocking 180 and counter clocking 180 get you to the same point. However, inside the body, you have to imagine how the catheter gets elongated in a three dimension. So basically, when you clock the catheter, uh, the JR4 catheter, 180 degree, it gets elongated anteriorly. And that's what makes it engage the RCA or the left grafts, which are anterior. Conversely, when you counterclock, the catheter points and elongates posteriorly. It tilts in a posterior direction, which allows it to engage the vein graft to the RCA, which typically is more posterior than the native RCA. And that's the reason counterclock often is successful for vein graft to the RCA. Now, that's not always true. Sometimes the vein graft to the RCA, the takeoff is at the same level as the RCA in an interposterior plane or a little more anterior. So those are cases where clockwise torque will work. I would say most often start with counterclock. It will work in my experience in about close to 80% of the time. If counterclock is not successful, then I start clocking the catheter, aiming in a more anterior direction, okay? So I hope everybody understands the difference between 180 degree clock versus 180 degree counterclock. It's a different elongation and tilt of the catheter three-dimensionally. Counterclock is posterior, clock is anterior. Okay. So another uh, idea, how to engage the vein graft to the left coronary uh, branches, OM or diagonal LAD. This one is more difficult. I would say engaging the graft to the right is usually easier. One, because it's lower. Uh, two, because its takeoff is low. Uh, three, it because it's more consistently counterclock. Graft to the left coronary is more difficult to engage. There is no definite rule. Most often it is clock to get the catheter a little anteriorly, but it's no, uh, it's no consistent rule. You may start with a clock, then if your catheter is moving away from the anterior surface of the aorta, you reverse it and do counter clock. So oftentimes I need a combination of both clock and counter clock. The key idea is to make your catheter in an audio view, make it point toward that anterior surface of the aorta, okay? This is an illustration here of an engagement of a graph to, to the uh, diagonal here. So this is the catheter here, and this is the marker to that graft. We're in an RAO view for left graft. So we initially tried clock, and we kept clocking. It went away here. You can see it. We kept clocking. It didn't touch that wall. It went away. So we counterclocked. So we started clock, then we eventually counterclocked. And here we counterclocked. We got to touch the wall, we hook that ostium. Once you hook the ostium, you have to push the catheter to make it point a little up for those left graft. This was specifically a JR4 diagnostic catheter. So now I'll answer the other idea, which catheter? I already explained it briefly, but I will detail it more. So we explained which view to engage, how to torque. Now in detail, which catheter to use to engage the graft. So you have two sets of catheters to think about for graft engagement. Think of catheter pointing down, which will be great to engage the RCA. Think of catheter pointing up, which will be great for graft to the left coronary. So catheter pointing down, the most important one is multipurpose. Multipurpose one, a shorter tip, or multipurpose two. Those are the most important one. RCB is another catheter. The catheter pointing up, the most important one is amplats left, one or two, the longer the amplats left, the more it can sit on the opposite aorta and the more it will point up. You also have LCB catheter and IM internal mammary catheter. Those will point up. 
Uh, just a slight explanation here. What is RCB? RCB is right coronary bypass catheter. It's a modification of the GR4 catheter. So this is a GR4. You make that tip point a little more down for it to engage the uh, right coronary bypass. So that's the RCB catheter. LCB catheter is similar to JR4, but this time you make the catheter tip point more up than JR4. So it's a modification of a JR4 catheter designed for the left graft. It comes in diagnostic and guide catheters. Okay. So again, I will repeat those ideas. So this is a vein graft to the right in an LAO view. We're orthogonal and we're looking toward the right surface of the aorta. So LAO view, right surface of the aorta. This is the vein graft to the right. It will be looking down and going this way. We engage it with a multipurpose catheter, which is my favorite catheter for those grafts. We get here a little below it. Then we pull with a counterclock torque and we get into it. You could have used as well an RCB catheter or an Amplatz right catheter, which points down like an Amplatz right one, which will point down. Here is an important tip in my opinion. I do avoid Judkins right four for right coronary bypass. Judkins right four, when you point it in this direction for the right coronary bypass, it tends to point too much up. So it leads to poor filling of the graft so much so then you may even think that the graft is occluded while in, just because you're not filling it well, while in fact it isn't. So I discourage you from using GR4 for the right coronary bypass. Use multipurpose or RCB or AR if you like, okay? Now, these are, these are a graft to the left. So what we use in this case, we use an Amplatz left. Usually uh, Amplatz left is a great for graft to the left, but mainly when you're trying to intervene, it is actually the single best guiding catheter for the grafts to the left. Uh, Conversely, for diagnostic purposes, you can try to use a simpler and less aggressive catheters. Typically, I do use a GR4 for left graft, so I do not use it for right graft. Again, it can make me miss the filling of that graft. I do use it frequently for left graft. I may as well use, if I have problem with GR4, LCB or IM. Then when I decide to intervene, I would use the Amplatz left. One to two, depending on the size of the aorta. So this is an illustration of how to engage with an Amplatz left. I showed similar case, some cases last week, but here I'll show again. This is Amplatz left engaging a graft to a diagonal. So again, like I explained in the past, this is Amplatz left one. I advance it in an elongated fashion with a free tip. Then I make that tip hook the ostium of the graft you know, I torque while it's free and elongated to catch that osseum. Once it catches it, I push to make it embrace that duck shape. Then I push, may push furthermore uh, to, uh, to give it that upward look and that full duck shape looking upward. If this doesn't work, if what I hooked turned out to be in the aortic wall, then I pull again, free the tip, elongate the catheter, and try again at a different level with a different torque and keep redoing this until what I hook is truly the ostium of the left graft. This is another illustration. So again, you advance the amplats left in an elongated fashion and you torque it in a free way until you hook the ostium of the graft. And once you hook it, you push it to make it embrace that duck shape looking upward. Okay. This picture, like a lot of pictures in this talk, are from my book, which is a general cardiology book, uh, but I do have also um, several uh, catheterization and hemodynamic chapters. This one here is an Amplatz left two. And generally speaking, to get the best support during intervention, uh, graft intervention, you really, you usually need a larger Amplatz left, usually not Amplatz left one, but Amplatz left one and a half or Amplatz left two. Here, I want to just comment on one uh, idea regarding those left grafts. I mentioned earlier that left grafts are diff more difficult to engage uh, than right graft. Uh, and I will elaborate on that a little more. 
there are two reasons why left graphs are more difficult to engage than right graph. One, the takeoff. Okay, the takeoff is more upward and shepherd crook. So which gives you less support, particularly during your interventions. Two, and very importantly, the left graft is high up, are high up, like I explained in my anatomy picture. So, which means that you don't have long enough platform in the ascending aorta after the aortic bend to support and prevent the catheter from flopping and falling in the aortic arch as you're trying to torque it and maneuver. You have better platform and longer platform and longer support when you're trying to engage the native arteries or the right graft, but because they are lower in the ascending aorta. This one is very uh, close to the uh, takeoff of the ascending aorta from the aortic arch, which again does not provide you that nice platform to maneuver. So the catheter has a propensity to fly out as you're maneuvering. Interestingly, even amplats left does not provide excellent support as uh, it may be hanging freely freely in the aorta. Evidently, amplats left, the beauty of it is that it usually sits on the aortic valve when you're maneuvering the native coronaries. But here it's not going to sit on the aortic valve and it may or may not be abutting the opposite aortic wall. That's why I mentioned you may need a larger amplats left to at least get sa that support from the opposite aortic wall. But uh, that's why left graft are difficult to engage than more difficult to engage than right graft. This is particularly difficult if you're trying to intervene. I find um, left vein graft intervention some of the most difficult interventions because of the poor support uh, in those cases. This is particularly worse if you're coming from a radial axis. Imagine you don't only have a short plat platform, you have a short platform after a very sharp angle from the enominate into that short platform. So left or right radial make your left graft engagement, particularly left graft intervention, more difficult. That, that catheter will tend to prolapse out into the aortic arch. That's an important point to understand of why we sometimes avoid radial access in graft patients. And I will explain that a little later. This is an illustration of a vein graft to the RCA. Again, this is RCA. So this is LAO view for vein graft to RCA. It's pointing nicely down. We have a multipurpose that dives deep into it and gives us an excellent and robust support. This is a vein graft to OM. Here I'm using an LCB catheter that modified Judkins right that looks upward, as I explained here. It's an LCB catheter. And um, look at that uh, graph that has an upward look with a shepherd crook. Now I will move to the fourth question, which is, okay, now we managed to engage that graph. What views do, you, do we use to, to image that graph? And there are two big views usually for every graft you engage. You generally need two big views. The first view is the straight view, the view you used to engage, which is the LAO straight for right uh, coronary graft or RAO straight for a left coronary graft. Those view, the straight view will show you very well, usually the ostia and frequently will show you well the body of the graft. So that's the first view, the straight view you used to engage. The second view, remember this, what is the second view for a graph to the right? It's the view that is good to see the native right. And particularly to see that the graft is usually hooked to the distal right and the PDA. So what view is good for the distal right and the PDA? It's an AP cranial or LAO cranial view. So that's what we use as a second view. The second view is a view you pick that is good for the native artery, as you already know from native coronary angiography. For example, for a vein graft to the diagonal or LAD, I would use an LAO cranial or a P cranial, which are good for those. For a vein graft to the OM, I would use a P caudal or RAO caudal, which are good for that graft, okay? And I try to steer away from the first view. So if my view, for example, I engage um, the um, LAD graft in an RAO view,
I try to avoid are you cranial because I want to take a view that is sharply different. So I do a P cranial or LAO cranial, even though RAO cranial is, would be good for the native LED, I want to steer away from the RAO that I used to engage. So I use LAO cranial or a P cranial. I want to see eccentric disease. So I like to be quite different from that first view to catch eccentric disease. For the Lima to LAD, I will describe the Lima a little later, but you need to know this. Beside those two views, for the Lima to LAD, we have to take a third view, a special view to see the anastomosis. Please, all of you need to memorize this. The classic view for Lima to LAD is the left lateral view, the absolute 90 degree LAO view, basically. That will show you perfectly well the anastomosis of the LAD to, to, uh, with the Lima. Uh, the problem, it is hard to do the left lateral. The patient has to raise his arms above uh, his head. So it's a lot of movement and it, may, it, is, it cannot be done in somebody with a left radial axis. So what I found is that RAO straight view very often provides me an excellent imaging of the Lima to LED anastomosis. So remember those two additional view, memorize them well for Lima to LED anastomosis and Lima to LED anastomotic interventions. Uh, another tip in terms of imaging, okay, you got those views of the graft, two views typically plus or, plus or minus the third one, especially for Lima to LED. Uh, sometimes you don't know, you know, you don't have the bypass report and you engage a vessel and uh, image it and you don't know, is it hooked to the OM or the diagonal? Here is how I tell you this. So this is a graft to the left, okay? It's an audio view and it's hooked to some branch here. Okay, is this OM, is this diagonal? So it can be difficult in some views. When you get lost, to me, what's most helpful is LAO straight or LAO cranial view. If the artery is running on the margin of the heart, on that left margin of the heart, it's usually an obtuse marginal. It could be a high, very high diagonal or a ramus, but usually grossly it's an obtuse marginal. If it is a diagonal in this LEO or LEO cranial, as you know from native uh, artery imaging, the diagonal will be running in the center of that heart shadow, aiming to the border, but running in the center. So this is how you can tell in those cases, LEO straight or, or uh, LEO cranial. REO caudal may also help, LEO caudal may also help. Superimposition of the same angle native views may also help. So use the same view for the graft and for the native, and you try to superimpose the anatomy. So, but if you re remember one, LEO straight, LEO cranial, and know the difference between OM and diagonal, uh, in that same view, if you have a graft to the right, it will be here, it will be somewhere here. Toward the right side of the heart, the PDA will be somewhere in the center, lower center. So that view is great. Again, REO caudal could help, LEO caudal could help as well. This is an illustration of such a case. This is a vein graft to the left, okay? It's hooked to an artery. Uh, you know, the fellow here thought this is a, maybe a diagonal or an LED. He thought maybe this is a diagonal and it's filling retrogradely the LED. He thought those are septals, okay? This view is an AP cranial view. So it was a little confusing for, for the fellow. So we did an LAO straight view, okay? On an LAO straight, well, this is a clearly an obtuse marginal branch, okay? It's on the margin of the heart in this view. This is an obtuse marginal branch. It could be a very high diagonal or a ramus, but actually we know from the operative report, this is an OM branch and it's filling retrogradely another OM branch. I'm going to uh, describe Lima engagement from a femoral axis. And I will describe later Lima engagement from a radial axis. So as I explained, Lima engagement consists of two steps. One, you need to engage the left subclavian, Two, you need to engage the lima itself. So how do you engage the left subclavian? First, you need to know the view. This is the standard anatomy from Netter. You do, do not use REO view. REO view will superimpose the ascending and behind it, the descending aorta, and it will superimpose all the supraaortic vessels. So you don't know where to aim your catheter. You want to aim your catheter into the left subclavian not the innominate or the left carotid. Well, all these are superimposed and overlap in an REO view. So do not use an or REO view. Use an LAO view with, which opens the aortic arch and the supraaortic vessels. 
So that's one important idea. And in an alley of you, you pull and you typically aim toward that horizontal portion. You see the catheter on a horizontal portion of the aorta. That's usually your aortic arch. And you aim toward the left side of that horizontal portion, which, where, which is where the left subclavian is. And you pull with a counterclock torque. Okay, so one, you need alley of you. Two, you pull in that horizontal portion with a counterclock torque. This is one of the constant in engagement. Counterclock to engage the supraortic vessels. Counterclock. This doesn't vary. Like I explained, right graft is usually counterclock, but sometimes you need a clock. Left graft, no, usually clock, but you have to try multiple clock, counterclock. This one, on the other hand, is one of the constant. It's always counterclock. So please memorize it. So you pull with a counterclock torque to engage the left subclavian. Again, the same idea I explained earlier. 180 degree counterclock will tilt you here posteriorly, which is how those vessels arise. They are a little bit posterior. Uh, 180 degree clock will point you more toward the anterior surface of the aorta and you're not going to be able to engage them. So it has to be counterclock. So you pull with a counterclock and once you get into it, typically I use a Judkins right four, the same catheter I use to engage the native right coronary. Then I engage the left grafts with it. Then I pull and engage the left subclavian. Okay, so I engage it with a GR4. Once I get the GR, GR4 in, I advance a long wire, 300 centimeter, a typical uh, J wire, and I advance that wire. Then I take my GR4 out and I advance an IM catheter to engage, an internal mammary catheter, which is better suited to engage the mammary. So I use a GR4 to engage the left subclavian, but I use an IM catheter to engage the mammary itself. And I exchange that via this, this long 300 centimeter wire. Okay. So this is an illustration of what I mentioned. This is LAO view. It's opening up your aortic arch here. This is REO view. Look, the arch becomes like a point. Everything is uh, superimposed and jumbled together. So you cannot engage the left subclavian in an REO view. Okay. This is an illustration of how you're counterclocking and pulling. And this is a typical view. You counterclock and pull and the catheter has fallen in the subclavian. Then you advance your wire deep, uh, close to the um, axillary, deep in the axillary actually. And then you take this out and advance an IM catheter. Now, I will detail that a little more. So, okay. We advance, our, uh, we advance our wire deep, then we advance our mammary catheter, IM catheter over it. I usually, after I advance the IM catheter, I position it here and I start pulling to engage the lima. You need to know the anatomical feature specifically of the lima. So lima tends to uh, arise around the bend of that subclavian, okay? So, fluoroscopically, wherever you see the catheter, you have a catheter in that subclavian, wherever you see it bending, this is where the lima is usually around. There are some lima that are arising from the ascending portion of the subclavian, and some are a little more distal, but typically it's from here, okay? And it's pointing downward. So that's one tip. Second very important tip, the lima is surrounded uh, consistently by two vessels, a little more distally, but very close to it, you have the thyrocervical trunk, it's looking upward, and a little more proximally, you have the vertebral artery. And always remember that shape, lima down in between those two up. So I position my IM catheter here and I pull it and I make it point down. If on my non-selective puffs, I see that thyrocervical trunk, I'm, I'm too distal, I need to just pull a little bit and I will be in. It's really very close to the lima. I need to pull a little bit and make my catheter point down and I'm in. If I see the vertebral artery, I know I'm already unfortunately too proximal. I need to readvance the catheter and try again. Those are the two big anatomical tips. In terms of maneuvering, the most important thing is to make your catheter look down, away from those two. Generally, I use a slight counterclock. So the same, what I use to engage the subclavian is counterclock. Generally, to engage the lima is counterclock, but one, it's a lot less, two, it's not consistent. So you may occasionally need a slight clock. The key is to make it point down. 
Now, what view do you use? You can use any view. You can use LAO. I frequently use AP. Uh, AP will kind of still show me that spread out of the subclavian, yet also show me the lima takeoff because it will be a little more orthogonal to the lima takeoff and it will make it easy for me to point my catheter down. So I tend to use a P view, but I think LAO is fine as well. It's just easier to make the catheter point toward you down in an AP view because you have to uh, make it point anteriorly and AP view helps you a little more point anteriorly, okay? Uh, this is an illustration I mentioned I use an IM catheter. What's the difference between IM and JR4? So IM, I mentioned in a prior slide for left vein graft, IM catheter has this shape. And it actually, when you're in a ascending aorta, it points more up. That's why it's a good diagnostic catheter for the left grafts. It points up. It's like a JR4, but the tip is more up. However, when you flip it, and you're trying to engage the lima, so you're making the catheter stand up, not look down. So when you flip it, then the tip of it will be pointing down. So it, it creates a great hook for that lima, which is pointing down. So that's why I use IM like, rather than JR4. Only when the mammary is arising from the ascending portion of subclavian, it may not be pointing too much down. It may be more of a horizontal takeoff. And this, those are cases where JR4 can be good to engage the mammary. Uh, but generally speaking, it's an IM catheter, which will point more down for the lima. It points more up when you're in the ascending aorta to engage the left grafts, okay? This is a summary of those steps for you to read. So LEO view, counterclock JR4 to get in left subclavian, advanced exchange length wire in subclavian. Uh, if very tortuous, use a glide wire instead of a standard stainless steel wire. Exchange the JR4 for IMA, may go to AP view and pull back with a slight counterclock and know the anatomy, know the relation between IMA, vertebral artery and thyrocervical trauma. So, and this is another tip. If you're having a hard time engaging the lima, but your catheter is close to the lima, but it's not fully engaged, you don't need to keep trying and risk dissecting the IMA. What you can do, you can do non-selective lima in geography. So as your catheter is somewhere around here, you inject non-selectively to fill that lima non-selectively. But in order to do that, you need to have a blood pressure cuff in the left arm and inflate that cuff and keep it up above the systolic blood pressure. So you create a diversion of blood from the left arm is still into that lima. Another idea I want you to know is, I mentioned we engage left subclavian, we, we advance a standard wire in it. But sometimes that subclavian is too tortuous and you cannot advance a standard wire in it. So those are cases where you may need to use a glide wire. Second idea related to that tortuosity is that sometimes you can advance the wire or you advance a glide wire, eventually a glide wire, hydrophilic wire, and you eventually get your catheter in the deep in the left subclavian. The problem, it's so tortuous that you cannot transmit any torque to engage that lima. So those are cases where you can engage the lima while keeping the wire in, like we do when we engage the left coronary from a radial axis, for example. So I engage the lima and I do my maneuvers with the wire in, and in very difficult cases, I engage the lima in and even image it with the wire in using a 0.018 inch wire. Another tip, after you engage the lima and take your picture, always remember to record the pressure pullback across the left subclavian to diagnose a subclavian stenosis, which is one of the most common causes of lima LAD ischemia. So don't forget that. You don't need subclavian in geography, you just need pullback hemodynamics. So I'll give here more illustration of lima engagement, which can be very difficult at times. So this is a case where we pulled our catheter, uh, JR4 catheter in the horizontal portion of aortic arch in a counterclockwise fashion, aiming for the left subclavian. We thought we engaged the left subclavian, but we gave a puff here. And you'll see, whenever that puff shows you this, you know you're in a descending aorta. That puff, memorize that view. This is a descending aorta. So you miss the left subclavian. Okay, so you pulled on the horizontal left portion, you miss the left subclavian. You're already too distal. You can start over. But if you keep starting over and missing the left subclavian, you should think this 
maybe that left subclavian is not on the horizontal portion of the aortic arch. Maybe, maybe that aortic arch is very steeply angled, okay? And what happens is what we call type three arch. And the left subclavian is more proximal that you think. The left subclavian is on the ascending portion of the aorta, not on the horizontal portion of the aorta. This is again, what we call type three arch, which is about 15% of the of aortic arch. Most aortic arch or type one and maybe type two in between those two, but 15% are type three and those, tend to be difficult to engage left subclavian, but also left carotid and enominate. So you have to aim to the ascending portion of the aorta in this case, not the uh, horizontal portion. You can try that by imagining uh, after you fail uh, engaging in the standard fashion, you don't need aortic arch in geography, but if you want to, you can do aortic arch in geography uh, to prove that point and aim uh, um, more specifically to the left subclavian. You can do the aortic arch in geography in subtraction imaging to help you aim for that left subclavian in uh, difficult cases, okay? And this is what we did here. After we initially failed, we went more proximal and we aimed more proximally and we get on the left subclavian. You see the left subclavian is a little more proximal than usual. So another tip here for Lima engagement, after engaging the left subclavian, the J wire and the standard stainless steel woolly wire could not be ad advanced across the proximal subclavian. What's the next step? I already alluded to the answer to that, but I will elaborate more. The next step is like I explained to advance a soft polymer wire, typically a soft uh, angle tip a glide wire. Okay, it's a very slippery wire that will be able to be advanced across tortuosity, including calcified tortuosity. Okay, so that's what you do. Now you advance the glide wire, you may have hard time though advancing the catheter. So what you try to do, you advance the glide wire and you try to advance the catheter over it. If it goes, great, you advance the catheter, then you exchange for uh, a standard J wire or Rosen wire, something is stiff, and then after you put the standard wire, then you exchange for an IM catheter. And those are the standard steps. Each time you have difficulty in the periphery, advancing wire across and catheters across tor tortuosity. So you engage the structure, structure, then you use an angled glide wire, soft or stiff body. Then you advance that glide wire deep and advance a soft catheter over it to be able to track over the soft wire. Then after you advance the soft catheter, you exchange for a stiff wire through that soft catheter, whether J wire or Rosen wire or Amplat super stiff wire. Then after you get that stiff wire, then you get your stiffer catheter. So it's always sequential, soft wire deeply, soft catheter deeply, stiff wire, stiff catheter. It's a common sequence you use for Lima, but we also use it in all peripheral vascular interventions. I will move on to another topic that is extremely important to me. I want to make sure as you're imaging the grafts and the native vessels to be able to put in your brain as you're doing all this, a map of the global coronary perfusion by superimposing in your brain, the native coronary perfusion anatomy and the graft perfusion, okay? So this is an illustration. You have here a vein graft to an OM2. It's filling that OM2 integrally this way and retrogradely all the way to the point of occlusion. So that OM2 is occluded osteally. Therefore, that graft is not feeding the circ. It's not feeding the OM1 and OM3. Therefore, even if you have a patent vein graft, if you have a 90%, 80% left circumflex stenosis, it may be worthwhile fixing it if the patient has angina in order to improve flow to the OM1 and OM3, which are disconnected from OM2, okay? So those are still dependent on the native circulation. So always in your brain, map graft versus native, okay? This is another illustration. This patient has a graft to the PDA, but that PDA is occluded osteally or maybe has a 90% osteal stenosis. So the graft is not properly filling the rest of the distal RCA. That rest of the distal RCA, the PLBs, 
are dependent still on the native right coronary. And if you have an 80% stenosis, you may have to fix it, okay? I will make it a little more complex and I'll give you the converse here. Let's say you're starting your case, you haven't injected the vein graft yet, you're injecting the native RCA. And you see on the native RCA in geography that it's filling distal branches. Well, you may think it's filling them without competitive flow. So you should have two reflexes here. One, maybe it's filling without competitive flow because the graft is hooked to a branch that is totally disconnected from my native right with a total occlusion, or I'm not having competitive flow because the graft is hooked to that branch I'm seeing, but the graft is occluded. So you should have two reflexes and keep in mind the graft could be disconnected to a branch that is totally disconnected from the native vessels. This is another illustration here. This is a lima to LAD, okay? It's filling antigradely and retrogradely up to the point of occlusion here. Well, those diagonals and septals here are still reliant on the left main and proximal LAD. And that's why you would see us fix proximal, left uh, proximal LAD and left main in patient with a widely patent lima to LAD just to improve flow to diagonals if we have large diagonals and septals supplying large territory with angina. The key is for the patient to have severe angina to justify such an intervention, okay? All right, this is another case. This is a patient with Lima to LAD, but those two scenarios are completely different. This patient has Lima to LAD uh, that is not filling retrogradely the diagonal. This patient is dependent on the anti-grade native flow for diagonal feeding. Therefore, if he has 90% here, it will impede the flow to the diagonal. It can create ischemia and angina, okay? Whereas here, the Lima to LAD is filling antigradely the apex, or it's filling retrogradely in an unobstructed fashion all the way to the first septal and the diagonal branches. So this Lima to LAD is providing much more flow, much larger territory than this Lima to LAD. Here, we don't care about 90% left main in terms of diagonal. If you have a good graft to the circ and you have a good graft to the LAD filling in an unobstructed fashion retrogradely, then we don't care much about the left main in this case. So always remember to analyze anti-grade and retrograde flow through the graft and superimpose to the native anatomy uh, and try to see which territory is not perfused, okay? So this is how you map eventually the graft and the native anatomy in your mind, or at the end of the case, draw it in this fashion, okay? Very important in my opinion. Why am I insisting on this? It's very hard for me to understand any uh, bypass graft in geography report. That, you know, that tells you something. I can't understand any bypass graft report. So I imagine it's very hard for uh, most cardiologists and internists especially to understand our reports. So we really need to restructure the way we report our, uh, our catheterization in case of a graft in geography. So here is how you should write it in my opinion. You should write it in terms of the three territories and integrating native plus graft uh, findings. So one, you can comment quickly in the beginning that about the graft, Lima to LED patent, SVG OM patent, SVG to PDA patent, but then split in three territory and elaborate. For example, this case, Lima is patent and fills LED integrally to the apex and retrogradely to the mid LED and D2. Proximal AAD and D1 still fill via native vessel and are impeded by 90% proximal LED stenosis, which may need to be fixed if angina and if the diagonal is very large. Two, left circumflex. OM1 is occluded and is not grafted, so this territory is ischemic. OM2 is grafted and has a patent graft, but does not fill retrogradely the circumflex. OM3 is fed by the native circumflex which has an 80% stenosis, so may benefit from an intervention if needed. So RCA, you have vein graft to PDA is patent, but the PDA is disconnected from the RCA and doesn't fill retrogradely the native right. There is a 90% retrograde stenosis. So the PLB, so the native RCA still feeds multiple PLBs and has an 
mid-vessel stenosis. So if those PLBs are huge and the patient has angina, you may fix the native 80% or fix a retrogradely through the graft, the 90% to provide unobstructed flow through the graft into the PLBs. So please restructure the way you, you write your reports. That's a very important point for me. Another uh, important idea about graft is there are two terms that we frequently use, sequential graft and split graft. This is a sequential graft. It's a graft that is hooked to, for example, OM2, and, and on its way to the distal most vessel, it hooks in a side-to-side -side fashion to another branch. So it's a graft to OM2 that hooks in a side-to-side -side fashion to OM1. This is what we call sequential or jump graft. We have something called split graft. S split graft, you have a graft that goes to OM. This is a graft A. And on that vein graft, you attach another graft, an arm B that hooks to the diagonal, for example. So it's almost like you have one graft and a branch coming off of it, or you can imagine it two grafts with one common stem. We call this split graft or Y graft. Why do we, why do surgeons do that sometimes? This may be useful in case there is shortage of vein. The patient doesn't have a lot of veins. That's one uh, advantage of the system. Another advantage is the patency of the grafts depending on how good the flow is. So the larger the runoff, the more the graft is patent. So it may be good to do this to increase the flow through the uh, common portion of the graft and to reduce the chance of occlusion of the graft by incre increasing the robustness of the flow. For example, if you have a small OM and you put a graft on it, the graft is likely to occlude. But if you put a sequential graft from OM1 to OM2, there is more robust flow through the graft and that graft may remain open even though it's supplying a tiny OM1, but the flow to OM2 is keeping that graft open. Another advantage is that you tend to have less aortic manipulation. You're putting one graft to M1 or M2 rather than two grafts, less aortic manipulation. So those are three advantages of this, uh, those uh, types of graft. One disadvantage uh, is that you need to do more uh, venous anastomosis. I want to describe radial access for graft cases. So, uh, Everything I described uh, except for Lima engagement applies for both uh, radial as well transfemoral cannulation of grafts. Now, when we talk about uh, radial access for uh, graft in geography, there are two big issues that arise. One, vein graft engagement is more problematic from a radial access than from a femoral access. That's one. Two, Lima engagement. And I'll comment on two uh, a little later, but let me start with why vein, vein graft engagement is more difficult. So again, it's the, the idea I explained a little earlier. With native arteries, when you're going from a radial access, you have an extra length platform that provides you with support and prevents the catheter from fall, falling in the aortic arch. I explained in the past that even for native, the shorter that aortic arch and the more sharply angled, the more difficult it is to engage native vessels transradially. Well, that's exactly what happens when you have a grafts, particularly left grafts. So you're having to try to engage vessels that are high on the aorta after a sharp angulation, whether from right radar or left radar, after a sharp angulation from the innominate and the aortic arch into that graft. So you have very little platform to provide you support uh, and to prevent the catheter from wanting to flip all the way out, okay? So this is particularly difficult when you're trying to engage left grafts, which are very high up in the aorta. And this is particularly difficult when you're trying to do left graft intervention, okay? Uh, for right graft, because they are lower, you tend to have a better support and longer platform in the ascending aorta. So engaging right graft from a radial axis is less problematic. So because of those ideas, here is what I do. In general, if a patient has left internal mammary graft and only a, a, a right graft that is patent, I do left radial axis. If he has uh, multiple patent left grafts, 
I do favor femoral axis unless he has uh, severe PAD and femoral axis is not an option, okay? Conversely, if he has Lima and right graft and he only has one left graft, especially left graft to the LAD, which can be a little easier than left graft to the OM, which is higher up in the aorta, I may choose a left radial or left or femoral, you know, depending on the case. So you understand I use in my mind how many left grafts he has to decide whether I do radial access or not. Now, when I choose radial access, I choose left radial access because of the lima. So the lima, so this is the second uh, idea in terms of uh, radial access for graft engagement, the lima. The lima is extremely difficult to engage from a right radial axis. It is, however, very easy to engage from a left radial axis. It is actually easier to engage from a left radial axis than from a femoral axis. So the way you do it, you advance your catheter uh, in the proximal subclavian, and then you pull it. And as it's getting pulled, the tip gets spread out and it hooks the lima. Uh, generally, I, I said from the groin, you, you typically you put your catheter here and you pull it and you usually need a slight counter clock. For radial, you typically need a slight clock uh, for left radial. But again, the key is to make your catheter points down and anteriorly in an AP view away from those thyrosurgical trunk and vertebra. Okay. So one other idea is that for the lima from radial, I don't use IM catheter. I use a catheter called BC catheter. What happens as you're pulling, as you position the catheter here and pull it out, it will, the tip will tend to be spread out and will tend to be obtuse and elongated. So you have to start with a catheter that is very sharp, even sharper than the IM catheter, so that when it spreads out, it will be able to catch. And when it becomes more obtuse, it will still be sharp enough to engage that lima. Okay, so I choose the BC catheter instead of the IM catheter. If you, if you start with an IM catheter, it will become too obtuse and it will probably not be able to hook the lima. Another catheter you may use is a catheter called VB1, uh, which also tends to have a sharp tip at the end. Okay. Another idea in those cases. So when I do... Uh, graft in geography from a left radial axis, the first view I take is the lima. I engage the lima, I do my views, then I go, then I go and engage the native coronaries and the vein graft on the ascending aorta. So after I engage the lima, I have to get uh, from the left subclavian and the ascending aorta. So here's an important idea. So sometimes, you know, you advance uh, your catheter uh, from the subclavian, you advance the wire and the wire goes in the ascending aorta. But what to do when your wire and catheter go in the descending aorta? It's very easy. Uh, the same way I explained uh, in the past, if you're coming from right radial and you fall in the descending aorta, you counterclock to pull and fall in the ascending aorta. That's another one of those consistent torque to go from descending to ascending from a radial left, right radial axis you counterclock and you fall in always. You don't need deep breath. However, if you're coming left radial, imagine you're coming in the opposite way, coming left radial and you fall in the descending to get in the ascending aorta from left radial, you typically need a clock. So it's opposite from this one. You don't need to memorize clock, just always memorize counterclock to get from descending to ascending from a right radial axis. And when it comes to left radial, while well, you're coming from an opposite way, imagine it should be the opposite. Okay, then you realize in your mind it would be clock. I would say just memorize the counter clock from right radial and intuitively guess what the left radial would be. This is an illustration of that BC catheter. We advanced it in the proximal subclavian, then we pull back and see how it becomes a little more obtuse and engage, engages the Lima to LAD. Okay. This is an illustration here of uh, an engagement. This one is actually from a right radial axis. It's even more difficult. We try to engage uh, left graft from a right radial axis. And again, there is a sharp bend that you don't see here that makes things more difficult. We tried here with a torque maneuver. Uh, this is for left graft in an audio view, torque maneuver. Typically clock, but we did the clock and counter clock 
we start down, we pull it up with a clock, then counter clock, then eventually got into it. And when we got into it, we push the catheter up to, in, to, uh, to, to embrace the takeoff of that graft. This was an LCB catheter. I think GR4 will be very hard when you're doing radial. I usually use GR4 when I'm doing femoral uh, left graft, but for radial, I would definitely favor something with an up hook, whether LCB or I am, or better yet, amplets left. Uh, particularly during interventions. We did the same maneuver to engage the graft to the OM. So he has a graft to LAD, graft to OM. So he had severe disease in the graft to LAD, this one. He had os cell disease and proximal disease. He also has severe disease in the graft to OM. So we fix both those using an amplets left to catheter. Okay, so again, you can see here from radial that sharp bend into the ascending aorta, which makes all maneuvers and support uh, very difficult because of the lack of stable long platform. So we were able to engage uh, using clock and counterclock maneuver to make it get to the anterior surface of the aorta. Once we hooked it, we pushed it up to embrace the takeoff. And we had to treat the ostium here, as you can see. We did the same thing to engage the graft to the OM. We use amplets left too. Again, I favor for left graft intervention, a larger amplets left, because again, a smaller amplets left would not be sitting on the aortic valve here. There is no aortic valve here, it's very low. You'll have to sit on the opposite aortic wall with a larger amplets also to make it point a little more up. Another idea here that makes amplets left more limited is that normally, you know, when you have an amplets left, you try to pull it after you engage, Sometimes we pull it to make it dive deep. Try to do that to get more support, except those grafts tend to look very much up, especially graft to OM, so that pulling it to make it engage deep doesn't always work because the catheter, when you pull it, will tend to point down and will go away from the takeoff. So that technique doesn't always work to get extra support. Another problem in those cases is that the disease was, was osteal. So it's hard to get support from deep engagement because you want to be disengaged and treat that ostium. This is the last idea I will provide. Um, again, I strongly suggest against uh, trying to do uh, graft cases from a right radial axis in patients who have a patent lemma. The reason I did a right radial axis in this patient is that he did not have a lemma. He had, as I showed here, he had a graft, vein graft to the LED. If you have a lima, patent lima, I would definitely avoid doing right radial. There is a way of engaging the lima from a right radial axis. First, you have to get into the left subclavian, then the lima, but it's extremely difficult. And I do not suggest it on a routine basis. In order to engage the left subclavian from a right radial, then through this, get to the lima, you'll do a lot of maneuvering and you risk creating a lot of atheroembolization in your aortic arch manipulation. And I think it should be associated with a risk of stroke. But I will give you the technique in the rare cases you should need it. So one, you get with a catheter in the descending aorta, catheter and wire, and you typically use one of those catheter, Judkins left, I am some sharp tip catheter, BC or LCB. You advance in the descending aorta past the left subclavian. Then you pull it to make it point up and you want to pull it a clockwise torque to make it point up, not point in the ascending aorta. Counterclock will make it in the ascending. So you counterclock to make it point into the uh, subclavian. Again, it's the opposite also when you go groin to get in the subclavian, you counterclock. This one, you probably need a clock, often at least. You get there, it's not easy to hook it, but once you hook that left subclavian, you advance a glide wire. You definitely need a slippery wire here. You advance a slippery wire deep, as deep as you can, into the arm if you can, and then you inflate a blood pressure cuff in the arm to hold that wire steadily, then you advance that catheter over that strongly held wire, if you can, into the left subclavian. And that will be difficult if that subclavian is uh, sharply bent and calcified. So you advance it to the left subclavian. After you advance it, then you can exchange that glide wire for a stiffer wire. Then potentially you can exchange for an IM catheter if IM was not the first catheter you used, okay?
another thing is that okay, we you after you advance the glide wire deep and you hold it with a blood pressure cuff, you may only be able to advance that catheter a little bit. You may not be advanced it, be able to advance it deeply, but if you advance it a little bit, few centimeters of the subclavian, that may be enough for you to get the support to advance a better wire. So we can take that wire out and advance a more supportive wire, a like Rosen or standard J-tip stainless steel wire, advance it more deeply. Then once you have a better wire, you can advance that catheter a little more deeply.